Hello, and welcome to the At School edition of the Genetics Video Review. Well, let's start up with some names, and they will pop up, so make sure you are at least familiar with the names and the ballpark experiment that they did. Don't get hung up in the years. So let's start with Rosalind Franklin. She used X-ray diffraction to help determine the basic structure of the DNA helix. Watson and Crick came along, and of course, they ended up getting all the credit, but it was her X-ray diffraction that was originally used to help determine the basic structure of the DNA helix. A little bit later in 1953, structure of DNA was already set. Uh, they won the no ended up winning the Nobel Prize for it, and once again, Watson and Crick got credit for it. Frederick Griffith, he did an experiment where he was looking at the uh, some bacteria, and he knew that there were some harmful versions and some not harmful versions. And what he did was he injected harmful versions into organisms and they got sick and died. He then took that harmful version and, and heated it up, thought he killed it. And when he found out later, when he mixed the what he thought was dead heat treated version with a live, not dangerous version, actually some DNA went between the two bacteria and they were able to take up external DNA in a process he referred to as transformation. And that was a big step in seeing that bacteria do, in essence, share DNA. Then uh, Mr. Shargoff came along and he came up with the A equals T, C equals G thing. So in doing that, if you did A plus G, would that equal C plus T? So let's say, for example, there was 10% A, that means there's 10% T, and that's 20%, so that means there's 80% left over for a total of 40G, 40C, your A's plus your G's equals your C's plus your T's. Then, a little bit later on, another experiment that we learned about here was from Hershey and Chase, and they were curious to see, was it proteins that were the genetic material, or was it nucleic acids? And they use these things called bacteriophages, and we learned a little bit about those in class the other day. We'll learn more about them later. But they are these protein capsid, and then the DNA is inside there. And what happened was they would infect bacteria. And this material that they weren't quite sure what it was, if it was DNA or, an MR or proteins, were then injected into the cell. So what they did was they used radioactive tags, whether sulfur or phosphorus, and that allowed them to determine it was ultimately nucleic acids that were the genetic material. Messelson and Stahl came along, and they wanted to figure out how DNA replication was. So what they did was they used a radioactive tag, let's say a radioactive the base A, and they sprinkled them all throughout their original strand of DNA. After replication, they found that in each new strand of DNA that was formed, only half of the strands had that radioactive isotope. So that, that led them to believe that DNA replication was semi-conservative. Then Avery McLeod and McCarthy came along, and they were like, hmm, they, they knew this Griffith thing was, was pretty legit, and they wanted to find out what exactly was being transformed in between these bacteria and they used various enzymes. They used proteases to break down proteins. They used RNA aces to break down RNA, and they used DNA aces to break down DNA. And after all was said and done, they come to find out that it was indeed DNA that is being transferred between the bacteria cells. In the three pictures on the bottom, we have three words. We have conjugation, transformation and transduction. The transduction we did not talk a lot about. We, we, it was basically brief just the other day. But Frederick Griffith, this is the old Griffith experiment right here, and he said that material was transferred, DNA, between bacteria cells. Then we talked a lot about plasmids over the last couple of days, and that is your conjugation, which is the bottom picture, where if a bacteria, let's say, is resistant to something with this plasmid, some antibiotic, it could actually transfer that resistance to another bacteria. So that was very good for them. 
in what is known as transduction, that was taking material from viruses and then spreading the genetic material and in injecting them into a separate bacteria cell. We did not talk too much about transduction, but all three of these will ultimately lead to genetic diversity even in bacteria. Now it is important to remember that bacteria have ribosomes, check. They may have a cell wall, check. They can make ATP, but they use something called glycolysis. They do not use mitochondria. And you'll also notice that these guys have no nucleus. It may be a nucleoid region where the DNA is, but they do not have a nucleus. On the next page, we're going to skip a couple of things because we did not do this experiment in the lab yet. <clears throat> so just disregard that. So now let's move down to DNA replication, which we actually did a while ago. And it all starts with what is known as a nucleotide. The nucleotide is the building block of the nucleic acid. Once again, is it, import it is important to understand that a nucleotide has a base, which could be the A, the T, the G, the C, or the U, depending on if it's RNA or, M RNA or DNA. It's going to have some sort of sugar, that's the S and it's gonna have a negatively charged phosphate group. Whenever you build, if you build up a nucleic acid and you add nucleotides together, you can only add from the to the three prime end. So in this particular case, you would add from the bottom of the page. DNA is different from RNA, a lot of reasons. DNA is, like we spent a lot of time about, talking about, is double-stranded where the two strands are held together by hydrogen bonds at the bases. DNA is very stable because of this, these bonds. And it runs anti-parallel. So once again, if that's the five prime, that's the three prime, which makes this the five and the three. So they are opposites of each other. They have a deoxyribose sugar. That's how you can tell they are not RNA. And you will find the, the base thymine, no uracil. It is important to remember that DNA is negatively charged, and that comes from the phosphate group. Now, that negative charged, or that negative charge to the DNA is what allows gel electrophoresis to work. You put a certain amount of DNA down here in this thing called a well, and then once you turn on the gel electrophoresis machine, you have a positive pole down there, and you start at the negative pole. Now, since DNA is negatively charged, it's going to be brought to the positive end. And I always use the analogy, it's like running through a bunch of trees in the woods. If you're by yourself, you can get through those trees very quickly. If you're holding hands with 50 people, it's going to take longer. So if you, if you look here at the pattern, 0.5 is a smaller piece. Let's say that's 0.5 thousand, so that would be 500. You can see that the smaller pieces move much faster the medium-sized pieces move slower, and then if there were any here, which there's not in this example, but they would be your largest pieces of DNA, and you would have broken up that DNA by using enzymes. As it says, we just said, the smaller fragments move farther, faster, towards the positive pole. Now, when you talk about DNA replication, which we just mentioned, it's all about during the S phase, or the synthesis phase, and that happens in interphase, before mitosis. Well, to build a new molecule of DNA, you have to get the nucleotides from somewhere. So they're either going to come from nucleic acids that have been recycled within the cell, or they will be brought to you by food. Because you have to imagine that the things you've eaten, whether they are plants or they are animals or whatever, they had cells. And if they had cells, they had DNA. And you, luckily, have enzymes in your body that can break down the nucleic acids into nucleic uh, nucleotides which you can reuse. Now this is a very simple picture of DNA replication but you'll notice that and again kids have a really hard time with this and, and that's annoying and I apologize but the black is your original strand and the blue is your new and if that's the three right there that means it has to be complementary to a five so that means that this end is the three prime and remember, we always build on the three prime side. So as you can see, this top strand is known as the leading strand. 
and that is because it is continuous and is constantly moving towards the replication fork. This other side is building also in 5 prime to 3 prime, but it's going backwards, sort of, and this is called the lagging strand. Now the lagging strand is going to go away from the replication fork and is going to be in small pieces, and those small pieces are going to be called Okazaki fragments, which will later be put together using an enzyme called DNA ligase. <clears throat> going through the list of all of the enzymes, we did this a lot. We drew a lot of pictures. We talked about it. Here it is one more time. The very first thing that has to happen is you have to unwind or take relieve the tension of the DNA. Because remember, it is curled or twisted, so you have to relieve that tension. You're going to do that with topoisomerase. That's enzyme number one. Then... You have to break the hydrogen bonds. That's going to be our buddy number two, helicase. And I drew it as a triangle like a wedge, but it's not really a triangle. And what that's going to do is it's going to break the bonds. You've now separated your two strands of DNA. You want to keep them from going back together again. So there are going to be these little proteins, and they're going to kind of bind right there, and they're going to kind of bind right here. Now, these guys are called SSBs, or single-stranded binding proteins. They're going to keep the DNA from smacking back together again. Well, you just can't start anywhere you feel like it. You have to know where to start. So you have to lay down something called an RNA primer, and you're going to put a primer down wherever you start. Then you're going to call in an enzyme known as DNA polymerase 3, which is going to add new nucleotides and grow your new piece of DNA. DNA is anti-parallel, so one strand is going to go towards the replication fork. Again, that's your leading strand. And then your lagging strand are going to be these little pieces that go away, otherwise known as Okazaki fragments. That RNA primer is great. Drop down by RNA primase. Everything's fantastic. When we, when, once we need to kind of connect the DNA, we have to get rid of those primers, these guys right here. And we're going to do that with the help of DNA polymerase 1. And then once we end up with these pieces of DNA that are just need to be stuck together, we're going to call in DNA ligase. And by the time you are done, you will have created two strands of DNA. Each strand is half new, half old, or I don't mean to say old, half original. And basically what that is is the semi-conservative model proven by Messelson and Stahl. Skipping the PCR because we did not do that for this chapter. Now, protein synthesis is kind of similar but different at the same time. You will start with DNA, just like you did in DNA replication, but instead here you are not making more DNA, you are making a molecule of mRNA. Now, RNA we know is going to be single-stranded, not double-stranded. It's going to have a ribose sugar, not a deoxyribose sugar, and it is going to have the base U with new T's. So as soon as they start talking about mRNA and you see T, that choice is wrong. And this process where you take DNA and you make mRNA is going to occur in the nucleus of eukaryotic cells and the nucleoid region of prokaryotic cells. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But what's going to happen is, with the help of your friend, RNA polymerase 2. Now, they may not put the 2 there. If they do, they do. They don't, they don't. That's okay. But here's what happens. You have your gene. Now, your gene, if you look, is up here. That's on what is known as the coding strand. The DNA polymerase is going to temporarily open up the DNA and it's going to begin to build this molecule of mRNA, which will later be translated into a protein. But right now we have to make the mRNA. And as you can see, as always, we're building it down at this end, so we're adding to the three prime side as usual. And you can see that this process is moving to the right on my paper. The gene, or the coding strand, is going to have the same base order as the mRNA. This other strand is known as the template strand. So sometimes they may try to trick you. 
Gem plate is actually opposite of the, which is the gene, which is crazy. So how is mRNA copied? It's copied five prime to three prime, just like DNA. Because remember, you can only add to the three prime end. You can't go adding wherever you feel like it. And it's going to be done with the enzyme called RNA polymerase 2. Sometimes the test may not have the two. You see RNA polymerase, RNA polymerase 2, same thing as far as you're concerned. We just talked about this. What is the difference between the coding strand and the template strand? The coding strand is where the actual gene is. And the template strand is what you are basically making your complement of. And that is important. So it is the gene that has the story. But since the opposite of that, it's template, that's what we're kind of basing our mRNA off of. Very, very, very important. And again, when you're dealing with mRNA, there will be no T's. Use no T's. So now let's talk about transcription in prokaryotes. They do not have a nucleus. So good news. No nucleus means there's a whole bunch of steps you don't have to do. So this is your DNA, which is represented by these two purple lines. There's going to be a promoter region, which we have talked a lot about. That's where you get started. You're then going to bring in your friend RNA polymerase, which is going to generate mRNA, which we just talked about. So there is your growing mRNA strand right there. And as it moves on down, it separates it temporarily, makes the piece of mRNA, the DNA closes. It knows when the gene is over when you reach what is known as the terminator region. And again, the terminator region is in the DNA. That is not a stop codon. Remember, a stop codon is on the mRNA. It's not a stop codon. It just tells us when the gene is done so the RNA polymerase can drop off. And that process will continue. Once again, you can see here in this picture that I'm adding my new nucleotides to the three prime end. And it's going to grow and grow and grow. They call it elongation. Now, if you are in a prokaryote, you are in even better shape because as fast as you can make that mRNA, which is over here, it's going to go right to the ribosome. And once it goes right to the ribosome, can it begin to make the protein? or the polypeptide chain. It all happens together at the same time. That's what makes things great in prokaryotes. In eukaryotes, things are a little bit different. You still have to have your promoter region. You're still going to have to have your gene. But in this case, you may be adding some different transcription factors, which again are these little kind of little, drawn like little balls there. And what may happen is if you need to speed up the process of this transcription, you may call in activators to the enhancer region, which will cause these DNA bending proteins to join the party, fold over the DNA, make this complex even more efficient. And in this case, you will definitely speed up the process. So this is all about speeding it up. Now, in eukaryotes, which would be you, your gene has a lot of excess bases in it, a lot of stuff you really don't need for that particular enzyme. So your coded gene is going to be way too long. It's going to have a lots of non-coding regions. We got to get rid of them. So what are we going to do? We got to chop them out. So we're going to call in some, some help. We're, gonna go, we're going to call in these things called SNRPs. These guys right there. Now they're going to be your pair of scissors, if you will. We're then going to call in some other proteins, and they're going to work together in this process known as a spliceosome. It's going to be a cutter and a gluer all at the same time. Now the intron, which sounds like it should stay in, actually does not. This is a non-coding region. So what the cell does is, is, I'm not wasting this, it's silly. So it calls in the SNRPs and other proteins, and this whole spliceosome thing gets going. And if you look at the picture, you will see that the part you don't want, that intron, gets cut out. So now this extra long piece of mRNA or pre-mRNA is now way shorter. 
So you got rid of your introns, which are your non-coding region. You splice together the parts you want, your exons. And again, life is great. So we have the job of our SNRPs, and we have the job of our spliceosomes. This is known as mRNA processing. And once again, this happens in the nucleus of eukaryotes. It does not happen in prokaryotes because they do not waste their time with pre-mRNA. They also don't have a lot of extra <clears throat> non-coding regions. Now that you have this trimmed down piece of mRNA that's now been spliced and diced there, you're going to add what is known as either a GTP cap, or you may call it a 5' prime cap. You'll see it both ways. And then you're going to add on a bunch of A's at the end, hence the term poly A tail. And what that will do, if you look at this picture, is it protects this area as best as it can, because if anything happens down here, that doesn't mess up the coding region. And if anything happens over here, that doesn't mess up the coding region. Pretty smart. If you look at this picture again, it's the same thing. You can see here how you have the exon which you want, the introns that you don't want, the exons, the introns, and the exons. Now, what's kind of cool about this is, depending on the ultimate protein you want, is it possible that some genes may code for multiple proteins depending on who gets spliced out? Again, I think that's pretty neat. Looking again at this picture, there's a bit of a zoom in. This is the part that you are interested in. It's protected by the cap. It's down here. It's protected by the tail down here. And life is good. And if you notice, the start codon's right there, kind of far away from the end. The stop codon's right there. You want to make sure that everybody stays intact, that nothing gets damaged. What happens if there is a mutation? Let's see. I may be given a piece of DNA, and you can tell this is DNA because I see the letter T. And this is definitely going to be the template strand, and you know that because I am making a piece of mRNA. Everywhere there's a T, I go to an A, which is great, but again, A cannot go to T, it's got to go to U. Once I get this thing called a codon, once again, a codon is only in mRNA, not DNA, not tRNA, only in mRNA. And each codon is three bases. You're going to use your fancy chart. And those three bases will code for one amino acid. And again, you do not have to memorize that. If you need it, the chart will be provided. So that's what we're doing. We're building a polypeptide chain. And building a polypeptide chain at the ribosome is known as translation. And of course, you need help from tRNA. What is tRNA's job? But it brings the amino acid to the ribosome where it can be built. If there is a mistake, we have lots of choices. First, let's actually talk about what, it, what these mistakes are. So if I have something called the point mutation, what that simply means is I will take, I don't know, let's say it was supposed to be CCA. Let's just say we'll use this example up there. And instead of CCA, I have a point mutation which makes it CCC. Well, CCC is going to go get a different piece of mRNA, which may go and get a different amino acid. It's possible. So we have three kinds of point mutations. We can swap out a base and stick in a nonsense mutation, which means that a stop codon gets put in the middle of the protein. That's bad because it's going to be too short. No good. A missense has the same number of amino acids, once you swapped your base, you ended up getting the wrong amino acid. So you have the same number of amino acid, but you got the wrong amino acid. So instead of getting a lysine, you got a valine or whatever. And then a silent mutation is nice because you're going to have no change in the amino acid sequence. Technically, if there was a silent mutation, 
you would never even know. So how great is that? Now the ones that are very detrimental to the synthesis of the protein or the amino acid chain or polypeptide, whatever you want to call it, that is an insertion or a deletion. Because let's say, you know, you had A, A, T, G, G, C, let's just say. And if you add a C there, everybody gets shifted over. And that is very, very, very detrimental. Known as a frame shift. Okay. That is protein synthesis wrapped up. Now let's talk about gene expression in a prokaryote. We just spent a lot of time on this. Oh, I lost a little bit of my typing over there. Something called an operon. Now what an operon is, and this is where a few people messed it up, <clears throat> an operon is a group of genes. Very important to understand. The operon is a group of genes. And those genes are right next to each other on prokaryotic DNA. And because they're an operon or a group of genes, they are either turned on or turned off at the same time. Now, if you are known as an inducible operon, what that means is you will turn on if you need to break something down. And the classic one that we learned about here is the lac operon. So if there is no lactose present, meaning the bacteria is growing and there's zero lactose, nobody cares, what's going to happen is this thing called the repressor protein, which is right there, is going to be sitting in the special region of the promoter known as the operator. Sitting there, blocking RNA polymerase from doing anything. So no lactose means no genes for enzymes to break down lactose. But in the event, this is why it's called inducible, in the event that lactose is present, and they may use the word allolactose, so lactose and allolactose, as far as you're concerned, they're the same thing. There it is. If lactose is present, look what it does. It takes this repressor protein that used to be squared off like that, and it changes its shape. So now it no longer fits in this operator region. So because it doesn't fit, guess who's free to now transcribe three genes, and that's the RNA polymerase. Now, here's where a couple people mess this up. These are enzymes. You are not making lactose. You are making enzymes that are going to ultimately break it down. Now, once the lactose is broken down, life is gravy because now the bacteria can use the building blocks or the glucose from the lactose. Once all of the lactose is used up, the repressor protein goes back to its original shape, slides right into the operator, and shuts down the operon, shutting it down. A cell is not going to make enzymes to break down lactose if it doesn't need it. The next one is known as a repressible. Now, the way I learned it is the trip operon is repressible. It's got an R in it, so that's how I remember it. Now, what happens in the trip operon is the bacteria need to synthesize tryptophan. Tryptophan is an amino acid, and you can synthesize it with several enzymes that are coded for by the trip operon. So once you code for all of these enzymes, no, oh, I don't even have a good picture of it. That stinks. So what's going to happen is if you need, let's kind of draw it here. I think, I think we lost it. If this is the DNA of the bacteria, and these are our genes, there are five genes in the trip operon. So what's going to happen is if there is no tryptophan, that means the cell has to make it. The RNA polymerase is going to jump on the DNA, and it's going to pass by our friend the operator region because nothing is in the way. So what will happen is the RNA polymerase can just zip right on through. It can actually transcribe all five enzymes, one, two, three, four, five, and those enzymes are going to go on to help you build TRIP. A lot of people thought that as the polymerase passes those genes, it makes tryptophan. It doesn't work that way. There's the enzymes first. 
Now, the reason why this is called repressible is once there is enough tryptophan, that is going to go and do and take the repressor protein and block the operator. So once there's enough tryptophan, RNA polymerase is blocked because, again, if I have enough tryptophan, I'm not going to make enzymes to make more. It's wasteful. So always remember that. Okay, that is gene regulation in prokaryotes. Well, what about gene regulation in eukaryotes? Well, eukaryotes are, again, you. These are cells with organelles. These are cells with nucleus, mitochondria, all that good stuff. So what has to happen first is you have to take this crazy DNA that you have, this chromatin, and you have to turn it into a chromosome at some time. And what that's going to allow is for easy packaging, if you will. Now, the way that's going to happen is the DNA, which we know is negatively charged, is going to wrap around these positively charged histone proteins and begin to make this coil shape. Now, this coil shape, the combination of the histones, which are these kind of purple balls here, and the DNA as it wraps around, that whole package deal is known as a nucleosome. And that is how DNA begins to kind of wrap itself up. Now, what's going to happen is in eukaryotic gene expression, in the event that my genes, that my DNA is tightly coiled, then I cannot transcribe the genes because if everything's jammed up too tight, the RNA polymerase cannot jump in there. In the event that the DNA is loose, it's further apart, that is going to allow for expression. So that is how eukaryotes regulate gene expression. If you don't want to express the genes, you're going to add a methyl group. It's called DNA methylation. That's going to cause the DNA to condense, which is going to give us no room for the RNA polymerase to jump in. Therefore, genes are not expressed. But if I add an acetyl group called DNA acetylation, that's going to cause the DNA to relax a little bit, open up a little bit. Now there is room for RNA polymerase and the genes can be expressed. Other things we talked about were RNAi, and that is where RNAi is going to interfere with RNA and the transcription of proteins or enzymes or whatever, and we saw that in the Petunia video. And another example is how epigenetics could potentially cause, that would be external factors, can cause your DNA not to change, not to be mutated, but to change its packing order. And in changing its packing, well, you know what happens. You're going to have um, genes either be turned on or turned off. So all of those are great eukaryotic gene regulators. And then finally, in the event that you have this protein that you are no longer interested in, you're a cell, you're going to call in the crew. Now the crew might be this ubiquitin, which is a tag. So what's going to happen is this enzyme that you don't want is going to get tagged with this ubiquitin. And then these kind of like enzyme ripper chopper shredders are going to come in and they're going to wrap up the protein you don't want and they're going to turn it into little bits. So once again, if that was an enzyme or a gene that you were expressing and you don't need it anymore, ubiquitin and proteasomes are going to come in, destroy the DNA, it can no longer be expressed, and there is yet another example of eukaryotic gene expression. So, in conclusion, this is going to be a huge test. It's got a lot of stuff. It's got DNA replication. It's got protein synthesis. It's got gene expression in eukaryotes and prokaryotes. We talked a little bit about genetic technologies. We talked a little bit about bacterial transformation. We talked a little bit about scientists that were big in the study of DNA. So you got your review sheet, you got all of your notes. Study it up and good luck.